to the Professional Lecture Series. I am Mary Lynn Wines, the Executive Director of the PHM Education Foundation. The Foundation is launching the series to connect area professionals to parents and community members on topics that are affecting them. It is our goal for you to walk away with strategies you can implement into your everyday life. Thank you to TCU, our presenting sponsor. Now, I would like to introduce our September speaker, Dr. Jennifer Sears. She's the Director of Social Emotional Learning and Mental Health for PHM Schools. And the Foundation's longtime friend and moderator, WSBT TV anchor, Bob Montgomery. And with that, I turn it over to Bob. Dylan, thanks very much. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being with us. Dr. Sears, good to see you. Thanks to see you as well. Yeah, I know, uh, let, let's jump right into it. I know social emotional learning is, I don't want to say the buzzword because we have seen uh, uh, methods and approaches of education change many times over the course of years. This is what we're talking about currently and, and it seems as though it, it resonates. It, it has a ring of, of truth to it as you, as you think about how, how kids learn and how, and how uh, the parents try to teach their kids and how teachers try to teach children as well. Uh, but, but I wanted to talk to you about some of the, the basics, especially when we're dealing with so many unknowns right now, you know, with, with the, the coronavirus setup and the, and the COVID and the hybrid learning and some kids are in class more and some kids are not as much. Uh, and speaking specifically from PHM, you know, it's, it's still that level of technology and face-to-face, uh, -face, et cetera. Let's start with the basics. What is social emotional learning? Sure. Well, you're right. It does have kind of a long history and has become more of like the buzzword lately, but um, social emotional learning was developed out of the um, Fetzer Institute in the mid 90s, a group of parents and uh, professionals got together and they were concerned about um, just how are we going to build these skills in students. And so out of this Fetzer Institute, they developed um, the collaborative for uh, academic social emotional learning and so or castle and that's kind of the hub of all things SEL and from that they developed a definition of social emotional learning and it's really the process by which both children and adults can acquire and effectively apply the knowledge skills and attitudes needed to manage their emotions recognize their emotions um, you know have stress management skills set and achieve positive goals show empathy for other people and then um, have these positive relationships and then eventually help them make positive responsible decisions. How is social emotional learning or SEL as you, you might call it, how is that different compared to what we saw maybe 20, 30 years ago? Sure. So when um, Castle first came out, they had these five core competencies. And um, since then, there's been a lot of brain research, you know, things develop. And so we have a lot more neurobiology bases to the SEL competencies, as well as um, some cultural sensitivities that we're more aware of in, you know, the course of 20 years. So, um, you know, in like 97, when Castle came out with these core competencies, things have changed. And then in January of 2019, the Indiana Department of Education came out with their own core competencies. And it was based on Castle's research. Um, and they, you know, they worked with Castle, but they used the brain research that has been available as well as the cultural um, competencies. And they have, you know, seven core competencies that we focus on. And now um, states are moving toward having SEL standards, like we have math standards or English standards. Now we have these SEL standards. And so it's really important um, that there's a big focus on this because the research has shown that this is really effective. In fact, um, Durlach and some of his colleagues did a big study in 2011 and found that uh, they did a, this huge meta-analysis on over 200 schools pre-K or kindergarten through 12 and found schools that had SEL in place, they performed 11 percentile points better on academic tests than schools that did not have it. And then they followed up a few years later and found that the um, those schools actually had a 13 point percentile gain. So the longer schools have these SEL um, 
initiatives in place, the more students are, you know, their academics are improving. And that's something that a lot of times we don't think about. We think about social, emotional, behavioral outcomes, but we don't think about the academic piece. And so there's been a lot of research that's been supportive of SEL and how important it is for students, not just um, behaviorally, socially, emotionally, but also academically. And then we're also helping our kids get ready for school. Forbes has identified, you know, how they come out with like the top skills that employers want. Um, for the skills for 2020 through 2022, 13 of the 15 are all related to SEL. So this is something that would help anybody in any field, really, truly. So let's talk about some of the basics of social yeah. emotional learning. So real life, how does this impact what happens in the classroom? Give me an example of how a teacher would approach a social emotional learning method versus teaching the very same lesson, but without it. Talk about the differences for SEL versus plan B. Okay. So just kind of basically, we are intentional about how we teach the SEL skills. So we um, have SEL lessons every week for our students in preschool, elementary, middle, and high, and then our young adult. Um, and so we're intentional about teaching those skills, but then we also want to start integrating those SEL skills into the classroom setting. So some of the ways that we do that um, just vary. So um, there's, you know, relationships are really important. Um, hearing student voice is really important. Um, teaching students to work together and collaborate on work, like things that teachers kind of do naturally, but we're being really intentional on that. Um, you know, helping students take different perspectives, even if it's a diverse perspective, empathizing with others, you know, so if it was like, um, say, a, a novel, um, you're using empathy and trying to understand that character's feelings, you know, or that character's perspective or background um, to help with, um, you know, integration of SEL skills. So just to, to, to dumb it down a little further um, for, for folks who are really trying to get a grasp on what this means, are you talking about it's, it's not so much that the teacher gets up and dictates to the student, all right, here's what you need to learn. I'm not going to take any input. I'm not going to see how you're feeling about this. These are the facts as they stand. I hope you got it on to the next lesson versus here are the facts. Here are some lessons. That, what do you think about this? Give me some feedback. Uh, walk me through what a, a, a typical lesson would look like for SEL. How would a teacher teach your student, how would a teacher teach my child about SEL without them knowing it's SEL? <laughs> without them knowing. Okay. So I think that actually teachers are natural at this. They, I mean, really, truly teachers are incredible. Um, and they just naturally do a lot of things related to SEL. So if we were talking about just a lesson and it was not an SEL lesson, say it was, you know, something um, with English or language arts, they might start off with, um, you know, asking an open-ended open question, you know, to get perspective so everybody can kind of have some input. And then um, they might, you know, read, read the novel or, you know, the chapter of the ex um, whatever the lesson is. And then they can ask questions about perspective, about what would you do, uh, diversity. It could be, um, you know, how could this person learn from their mistake? If we're talking about mindset, we could, you know, be identifying emotions um, and how that might affect their action or the character's actions or their thinking. It could be like, what would you have done in this situation? What are some like regulation strategies that you might have tried? Um, and then maybe they partner up and they work in a group and um, then they have this product at the end. So there's a lot of things that you can do really easily to integrate SEL into everyday. Um, and really, you know, it's been said that all learning is social and emotional. And I think it's because it's all relationally based. And so I think um, the other piece that's really, really important is that relationship that's so valuable between a teacher and a student. Um, and so that really is kind of the foundation for all learning. So does social emotional learning work as well with more technical courses? I'm thinking like math, calculus, science, things like that, as it does with some of the things that, that, that you would think might be more apt to go for. Like, for example, you just gave the, the instruction of language arts or English classes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's a great question because a lot of times people are like, okay, this is so black and white. How do we integrate these different um, aspects? And so that's where you can use things like collaboration or maybe if it's math, your word problem might have, you know, some pieces of SEL in the word problem. So a lot of it boils down to those relationships and the connection um, that people have around that, of course. Um, different subjects lend themselves a lot more to SEL than others, but um, you can use SEL skills for any for any subject. So specifically, Penn Harris Madison has been on board with this for a while, and in full transparency, we're recording this on the 30th day, the last day of the month of September, and we are before a school board meeting in which the school board will be voting on the teachers having the option of teaching either virtual or, or teaching in person. And some would say that might be an opportunity for SEL to impact the teachers as well. But this is, isn't just based upon the needs of the student. This is also recognizing the needs of the teacher to be most effective at what they're trying to do. Is this part of that? Is this part of that uh, recognizing that the teachers also have a social emotional aspect of their jobs, that if they're not 100% whole, they won't, they won't be effective social emotional teachers? Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, when we think about social emotional learning, uh, adult SEL is just as important. And so when um, we first started this, we started with just professional development to share what SEL is. Uh, we had a half day SEL initiative the summer before we launched like this big initiative um, in 2019. And then we did opening day. And then we've had a lot of SEL at uh, our PD at schools with um, different things. Now, stress management is a huge thing. Um, and the change, any type of change that we have, you know, in our lives and COVID has been a huge change for all of us. Um, that can cause stress. It can be um, the what ifs, the unknowns. Um, I'm doing something new. Um, there's a lot of things with COVID that seem out of my control. And so it's, really focusing on what are important stress management techniques for us as adults to develop and then model for our students as well. So our, our teachers, our staff are just as important. In fact, during the quarantine in the spring, um, we had our largest professional development initiative ever in our district. And every day we had an SEL uh, professional development for adults. So it's transportation, it was food service, custodial staff, um, you know, anybody in PHM who had a position had access to these and so that they could learn about just SEL skills, motivation, stress management, all of that. So it was really important that we um, pour into our staff as well. So yeah, I mean, and with COVID, um, you know, we're in a constant state of stress. Our bodies, you know, our stress response hasn't shut down. So we're, you know, we're feeling a lot more just naturally because, it, you know, things haven't stopped. And so um, it's really important that we focus on self-care and stress management as we adapt to changes. And that, and that goes for any, anybody in really globally right now um, as we're all adjusting to changes. Yeah, it certainly makes sense. Uh, Dr. Thacker talks about his, his uh, triangle of success uh, regularly. Uh, and as anybody knows, if you look at a stool or a triangle, if you have one side that's, that's off kilter compared to the rest, you run the risk of collapse. And uh, so it's important to, to make sure all the sides are, are uh, uh, supported as much as possible. Social emotional learning, if each one of them has their own individual uh, definition, if you want to call it that, um, but they also are interdependent as well. They go hand in hand as well. So when, when you look about uh, the, the independent and the dependent nature of the whole aspect of social emotional learning, is there one part of that that is more important than the other? Mm. Um, I think it's all important, but I would say if I were to say what is the most important um, competency, I would, I would really say it has, it boils down to just relationship skills, collaboration, and connection. And I think that's really important, especially right now with COVID. Um, you know, we're, we're more isolated than we have been, you know, we're like the three of us, we're on our, 
separate offices recording this Zoom, and we're fortunate to have this technology that we didn't have, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, so we can still make connections and life can still move forward with some minor tweaks, but um, I think that it's so important to reach out and make sure you're staying connected. Um, that would, for me, that would be the most important one, especially in our current situation right now with the pandemic. Yeah, how are you handle it, handling that with the virtual kids? Um, and obviously all the kids are virtual to some extent, except for the elementary students who are in class every day, but middle and high schoolers, they're, they're three days a week at home, they're two days a week in school. The social part of it seems like, uh, okay, when they're in school, they have that opportunity at, at the very least. But for the kids who are not in school at all, those who are opting to stay home completely virtual, how do you handle the social side of it more than just you know a, a piece of paper or, or a lesson that you read on your on your laptop? Yeah, so I think that boils down to those um, teachers, you know, making connections with students, um, touching base with them. Um, I have you know two students in PHM right now who are at the secondary level, sixth and a ninth grader, and their teachers have reached out and said you know how much they appreciate the conversation. So I think it's conversations like through um, through Zoom or through Google Meets um, that are really important. And then um, students can still take part in clubs, even though it's virtual. They can still you know, still be connected to their school um, family. And so I think it's doing things like that to make sure that we're having touch points, we're having discussions um, virtually, and then we're allowing opportunities for people to still stay connected to the school um, in just different ways. Yeah, so what, what are some of the big initiatives right now? Uh, we know where we were, we know where we are. What's coming next for PHM on, along the lines of social emotional? So that's a great question. So um, lots of great things. We're continuing with our weekly lessons. Um, then we also, I'm working with our diversity, equity, and inclusion officer um, who, you know, so we're trying to partner up with some of those initiatives. We also have a huge focus on um, our staff this year. So we want to make sure that we're pouring into our staff. So. Uh, we've partnered with a company called Applied EQ, and um, the nice thing about this company is they have a personality assessment that's based on social-emotional learning that people can optionally take, and then we have, we'll have webinars for people to understand their personality and kind of how they're wired um, to make relationships and handle stress. And then that, that helps people understand who they are. You have more insight about maybe um, what your strengths are, what your liabilities are, and then how to build off of those strengths. And it just gives people tools um, and understanding to help us have, um, you know, continue moving forward. So that's one of the big initiatives that we have coming up. We're also um, doing some restorative practices. I don't know if you've heard of that before, but restorative practices is um, something that we started as a big initiative last year in our district. And it is a social science that really is based on relationships. And so it's the idea that um, you build community, you're really intentional about building community. And then restorative practices also has um, different techniques that you can use to repair harm. So if harm is done, you can go through these different processes and um, to maintain that relationship. So we have a focus on that. So we're training people on restorative practices. Um, and we've also used some restorative practice techniques with our SEL lessons so that we are, can be really intentional about building that community. Um, we're trying to focus more on just um, getting information out, resources. We have a great uh, partnership with Youth Service Bureau and um, they have youth development specialists who have been working with us for actually for three decades, over three decades. And so um, utilizing that wonderful staff to help um, with crisis intervention, help students with behavioral or social um, supports in school. And, um, and then just trying to reach out to students as much as possible and keeping those um, relationships going. Um, we'll always have resources for parents and I'm available to come talk to PTOs if they would like, would like that. And then I have um, 
some partnerships with community agencies and we have started like a a panel series so we actually ironically just recorded one on stress management so kind of getting that information out there um, to parents as much as we can to help support them in this process and to know how to support their students as well through through everything so those are some of our big initiatives coming do, up. Do you think, uh, you know, hopefully, knock on wood, one of these days we'll get all the kids back in class yeah. and we'll have some semblance of normal, whatever the new normal is going to be, we'll have yeah. some semblance of it. What kind of challenges do you think this will present? Uh, not just social emotional learning, but a person uh, such as yourself who's um, oversees the, the, the social and emotional well-being of the, all the kids in the district, what kind of challenges are they going to face as they try to get back into, in essence, living again with their school friends and kids? Yeah, so that's a great question. You know, as we look at, um, you know, students coming back and um, I think students, just like adults, have a lot of questions, like a lot of what ifs and um, concerns and they might not realize it. As adults, we can, process through a little bit more and we can put um, language and you know to our thoughts some of our students are processing this and maybe don't have the understanding or the words depending on their age or developmental level um, and so it's helping students become aware of their thoughts and their emotions and then really focusing on like okay, it's okay to have these feelings, but what can we do with that? How can we cope? How can we regulate that so that we're healthy and we're moving through that? Some of the other things um, that we might experience, especially for our younger kids, um, you know, they've been at home for five or six months with family, which is wonderful, wonderful, you know, but at the same time, there's that separation anxiety piece that they've been home with everybody. And so, you know, you might see some more clinginess, you might see kind of a regression in some behaviors for some kids, and that's pretty normal. And so it's kind of just weathering some of the, some of those storms, so to speak, um, and helping students adjust. Um, some of the other things, just I would say making sure students are aware of what's going on, telling them of changes, you know, so that we don't, um, you know, create more anxiety in them if they, because the what ifs yeah. and the unknowns cause some anxiety. So just, just communicating with our students. Yeah, there's a, there's a fine line between, especially based upon the age of giving kids information. To yeah. Help yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So, uh, crystal ball time. I'm, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> oh, great. I'm, I'm I did not bring that this morning. <laughs> well, hopefully you can shine one up here real quick. Um, I just wanted to ask you what you think based upon the current research is coming next. I'm not suggesting that social emotional learning is it's the fat of the day. And then next we're going to have another fat of the day coming up soon. Who knows what's going to happen next because sometimes the research has, doesn't even exist yet. But of what you have seen recently, is there anything coming down the pipe that says, this social emotional learning model we have today will lead to this next, what that this might be? Oh yeah, that's a great question. I think um, social emotional learning has been important in the past. And I think now more than ever that it's like the thing. Um, and so I think with, um, with everything that we're going through right now, I think people are realizing how important it is. And I, you know, 2020, the year 2020, it's been said like 2020 vision, you know, and I, I do think that with everything going on, we still can have some clarity about what's really important and what really works. And so when you boil it down, um, I think social emotional learning is foundational. So I think that as we're going through um, these changes, we're realizing how important these kind of basics are and how we need to continue embracing that as we move forward with the field of education. So I think that there'll be a lot more emphasis on social emotional learning because people are realizing the value of it. All right, Dr. Jennifer Sears, thanks for your time, I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Mr. Montgomery, it was a pleasure. Mr. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you, Dr. Sears. <laughs>
So thank you both. Wow, what, um, what, great, what a great conversation. And I love the emphasis of positive relationships um, that Dr. Sears mentioned and um, how important that is, especially during this time of COVID, that you're reaching out and connecting with others, either through Zoom like we are or through a phone call, um, just checking on each other. Um, so important. And um, thank you, Bob, for always asking the questions that everyone has on their mind and, and may be afraid to ask, but certainly um, important ones. Um, thank you both. I appreciate this. I really feel that this is going to um, help our parents and community understand the importance of social emotional learning. Um, and we, we appreciate it. Just a quick thank you again to TCU, our presenting sponsor, and a reminder of two more speakers that are coming up um, in um, October. We will have PHM's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer, Derek White. And then in November, we will have two TCU representatives talking about personal finance with the holidays. Um, certainly COVID um, may had a financial impact on your pocketbook. And so they're gonna give us some tips. Um, so sign up for those two upcoming lectures at um, phmef.org. And again, thank you, Jennifer um, and Bob for your time and expertise. Goodbye.